MS found in a bottle. I have often been reproached with the aridity of my genius. A deficiency of imagination has been imputed to me as a crime. I have thought proper to premise thus much, lest the incredible tale I have to tell should be considered rather the raving of a crude imagination than the positive experience of a mind to which the reveries of fancy have been a nullity. After many years spent in foreign travel, I sailed in the year 1800 from the port of Batavia, in the rich and populous island of Java, on a voyage to the Sunda Islands. I went as passenger, having no other inducement than a kind of nervous restlessness which haunted me. Our vessel was a beautiful ship of about four hundred tons, copper-fastened and built at Bombay of Malabar Teak. We got under way with a mere breath of wind, and for many days stood along the eastern coast of Java, without any incident to beguile the monotony of our course. One evening, leaning over the taffrail, I observed a very singular cloud to the northwest. It was remarkable, as well for its colour, as from its being the first we had seen since our departure from Batavia. I watched it until sunset, when it spread all at once to the eastward and westward like a long line of low beach. My notice was soon afterwards attracted by the dusky red appearance of the moon and the peculiar character of the sea, which seemed more than usually transparent. As night came on, every breath of wind died away, and a more entire calm it is impossible to conceive. The flame of a candle burned upon the poop without the least perceptible motion. However, as the captain said he could perceive no indication of danger, and as we were drifting in to shore, he ordered the sails to be furled and the anchor let go. No watch was set, and the crew, consisting principally of Malays, stretched themselves upon deck. I went below, not without a presentiment of evil. Indeed, every appearance warranted me in apprehending a simoon. I told the captain my fears, but he paid no attention to what I said. My uneasiness, however, prevented me from sleeping, and about midnight I went upon deck. As I placed my foot upon the upper step of the companion ladder, I was startled by a loud humming noise. Before I could ascertain its meaning, I found the ship quivering to its center. In the next instant, a wilderness of foam hurled us upon our beam ends, and, rushing over us fore and aft, swept the decks from stem to stern. The extreme fury of the blast proved, in a great measure, the salvation of the ship. Although completely waterlogged, she rose after a minute heavily from the sea and, staggering beneath the immense pressure of the tempest, finally righted. Stunned by the shock of the water, I found myself upon recovery, jammed in between the stern post and rudder. With great difficulty, I gained my feet, and looking dizzily around, saw how terrific was the whirlpool of mountainous and foaming ocean within which we were engulfed. After a while, I heard the voice of an old Swede, who had shipped with us at the moment of our leaving port. I hallooed to him with all my strength, and presently he came reeling aft. We soon discovered that we were the sole survivors of the accident. All on deck, with the exception of ourselves, had been swept overboard. The captain and mates must have perished as they slept, for the cabins were deluged with water. For five entire days and nights the hulk flew at a rate defying computation, before rapidly succeeding flaws of wind which, without equaling the first violence of the simoom, was still more terrific than any tempest I had before encountered. Our course for the first four days was southeast by south, and we must have run down the coast of New Holland. On the fifth day the cold became extreme, although the wind had hauled round a point more to the northward. About noon, as nearly as we could guess, our attention was again arrested by the appearance of the sun. It gave out no light, properly so called, but a dull and sullen glow without reflection, 
as if all its rays were polarized. Just before sinking within the turgid sea, its central fires suddenly went out, as if hurriedly extinguished by some unaccountable power. Thenceforward we were enshrouded in darkness, so that we could not have seen an object at twenty paces from the ship. Superstitious terror crept by degrees into the spirit of the old Swede, and my own soul was wrapped up in silent wonder. At times we gasped for breath at an elevation beyond the albatross, at times became dizzy with the velocity of our descent into some watery hell. We were at the bottom of one of these abysses when a quick scream from my companion broke fearfully. See, see, cried he, shrieking in my ears, Almighty God, see, see. As he spoke, a sullen glare of red light streamed down the sides of the vast chasm where we lay and threw a fitful brilliancy upon our deck. Casting my eyes upwards, I beheld a spectacle which froze the current of my blood. At a terrific height directly above us, and upon the very verge of the precipitous descent, hovered a gigantic ship of perhaps four thousand tons. At first her bows were alone to be seen, then she rose slowly from the dim and horrible gulf beyond her. For a moment of intense terror she paused upon the giddy pinnacle as if in contemplation of her own sublimity, then trembled and tottered and came down. At this instant, I know not what sudden self-possession came over my spirit. Staggering as far aft as I could, I awaited fearlessly the ruin that was to overwhelm. Our own vessel was ceasing from her struggles and sinking with her head to the sea. The shock of the descending mass struck her consequently in that portion of her frame which was already under water, and the inevitable result was to hurl me with irresistible violence upon the rigging of the stranger. As I fell, the ship hove in stays and went about, and in the confusion ensuing I attributed my escape from the notice of the crew, and with little difficulty made my way unperceived to the main hatchway, which was partially open, and soon found an opportunity of secreting myself in the hold. This I did by removing a small portion of the shifting boards in such a manner as to afford me a convenient retreat between the huge timbers of the ship. I had scarcely completed my work when a footstep in the hold forced me to make use of it. A man passed by my place of concealment with a feeble and unsteady gait. I could not see his face, but had an opportunity of observing his general appearance. There was about it an evidence of great age and infirmity. He muttered to himself in a low, broken tone some words of a language which I could not understand, and groped in a corner among a pile of singular-looking instruments and decayed charts of navigation. He at length went on deck, and I saw him no more. It is long since I first trod the deck of this terrible ship and the rays of my destiny are, I think, gathering to a focus. The men, wrapped up in meditations of a kind which I cannot divine, pass me by unnoticed. Concealment is utter folly on my part, for the people will not see me. It was no long while ago that I ventured into the captain's own private cabin and took the materials with which I write and have written. I shall from time to time continue this journal. It is true that I may not find an opportunity of transmitting it to the world, but I will not fail to make the endeavour. At the last moment I will enclose the manuscript in a bottle and cast it within the sea. About an hour ago I made bold to thrust myself among a group of the crew. They paid me no manner of attention, and although I stood in the very midst of them all, seemed utterly unconscious of my presence. Like the one I had at first seen in the hold, they all bore about them the marks of a hoary old age. Their knees trembled with infirmity, their shoulders were bent double with decrepitude, eyes glistened with the room of years, 
and their grey hairs streamed terribly in the tempest. The ship has continued her course due south, rolling every moment her top gallant yard arms into the most appalling hell of water, which it can enter into the mind of man to imagine. We are surely doomed to hover continually upon the brink of eternity without taking a final plunge into the abyss. I have seen the captain face to face and in his own cabin, but, as I expected, he paid me no attention. Although in his appearance there is, to a casual observer, nothing which might bespeak him more or less than man, still a feeling of irrepressible reverence and awe mingled with the sensation of wonder with which I regarded him. In stature he is nearly my own height, that is, about five feet eight inches. He is of a well-knit and compact frame of body, neither robust nor remarkable otherwise. But it is the singularity of the expression which reigns upon the face. It is the intense, the wonderful, the thrilling evidence of old age, so utter, so extreme. His cabin floor was thickly strewn with strange, iron-clasped folios and obsolete, long-forgotten charts. His head was bowed down upon his hands, and he pored with a fiery, unquiet eye over a paper which I took to be a commission, and which, at all events, bore the signature of a monarch. All in the immediate vicinity of the ship is the blackness of eternal night, and a chaos of foamless water, but about a league on either side of us may be seen, indistinctly and at intervals, stupendous ramparts of ice, towering away into the desolate sky and looking like the walls of the universe. It is evident that we are hurrying onwards to some never-to-be-imparted secret, whose attainment is destruction. Perhaps this current leads us to the Southern Pole itself. It must be confessed that a supposition apparently so wild has every probability in its favor. The crew pace the deck with unquiet and tremulous step. But there is upon their countenance an expression more of the eagerness of hope than of the apathy of despair. In the meantime, as we carry a crowd of canvas, the ship is at times lifted bodily from out of the sea. The ice opens to the right and to the left, and we are whirling in immense concentric circles, round and round the borders of a gigantic amphitheater, the summit of whose walls is lost in the darkness and the distance. But little time will be left me to ponder upon my destiny. The circles rapidly grow small. We are plunging madly within the grasp of the whirlpool, and amid a roaring and bellowing and thundering of ocean and of tempest, the ship is quivering, oh God, and going down. Owen Teal was reading MS Found in a Bottle by Edgar Allan 